Hello, it's Mrs McPherson, Assistant Head Teacher at Stephen and Grantham Girls School and my responsibility is for post-16 education and welfare. About April every year, um, we usually um, start talking to the Year 12s about planning their post-18 futures. They usually have two talks about higher education and those are going to be delivered to them. One which is about why they might want to go to university and the second is about the process. We usually offer a higher education information evening to parents in April too to take parents through the whole process so that they too can understand what their daughters will be going through throughout the rest of year 12 and into year 13 regarding applications to university. There are three key topics that I'd like to outline for you. They are divided up into three separate presentations so that you can decide which topics are relevant for you to um, tune into. So this presentation is all about the higher education landscape today, what's going on and how it might affect our students. The second presentation is all about how we set and um, use predicted grades and how they might affect a student's choices and how they might relate to the progress grades that parents receive. And the third presentation is all about the application process itself. When do things happen? What happens? What do students need to do? How does that happen internally at KGGS and how does that happen through the UCAS application system? As I say, please feel free to dip in and out of those presentations. So this first presentation about the higher education landscape. I'm guessing that if you listen to my presentation that you are probably already convinced that higher education is a good thing. But I thought I'd just start by highlighting the benefits that students will receive. There has been plenty of um, research into earning potential, which is my last bullet point here. And it's clearly evidence that dur during their lifetime, graduates will earn more. There are such a wide range of courses available that if any of our students are considering university, they really should be able to find something that attracts and appeals. One of the first questions students will need to ask themselves is what to study. And this is quite a big question. As we're a grammar school and the majority of our students will end up with really good grades, it's tempting to think about vocational degrees. What I'm thinking about there is medicine, vet science, dentistry, law perhaps. Those are tempting simply because they offer employment security and many of them offer sort of pretty good earning potential in the future. But it is important to consider that they are vocational. So the student really needs to be committed and passionate about doing those jobs in the future. Many of these types of degrees have really rigorous selection processes carried out by the universities, admissions tests as well. The requirement for a lot of work experience be it virtual or practical, is, is there as well. So students really need to consider, is this for me? Is this what I really want to do? It's not something that should be entered into lightly just because it's something that's easy to do, something that leads directly into a career. Students have, subject, have, have studied a range of subjects at GCSE and they've slimmed that down to three or four at A level. Should they continue with one of those? Well, it's something for consideration. But again, they've got to remember that a lot of the study at university is, is, needs to be self-motivated. They need to have that initiative and drive to want to learn more about that subject. They're also going to be studying it much more intensively than they are now. So do they really love it enough to continue? We will advise students at their higher education talks that they don't need to decide on a career yet. 
they don't really need to know what they want to do when they grow up. That is if they are thinking of university. Because degree courses give transferable skills, and I'll talk about this on the next slide. They might want to consider a joint honours or a modular degree. A joint honours is where the student will study more than one subject. And a modular degree is where there might be a whole range of different modules that the student can select from. So they're virtually building their own degree. And there are lots of subjects that you haven't thought about or come across yet. Narrow thinking. King's College London, very prestigious university, quite high entry criteria to get in, offer nearly 150 courses. And they receive a huge amount of applications, but 70% of those applications are for 20 of those courses and 50 for nine of those courses. So we try and encourage our students to think much more broadly about what they might want to study. What about employers? What are they looking for? Well, the Confederation of British Industry consistently gives this message. The first consideration when thinking about employing a graduate would be what class of degree did they get? As I said, degree study is m very self-motivated. The students need to be driven. So the class of degree will indicate how hard that student worked at university. They want people who are self-starters and hard-working. Secondly, which university did they go to? So how, how hard did they work at school? And then thirdly, so you can see it's the third most important thing, what was the subject? All div degrees will give transferable skills to our students. And Employers recognise that. Really what you learn about going when you go to university is learning to learn, learning to be that person who is driven to learn more. And that's what a degree qualification will tell an employer. I'm sure that you all know plenty of people who are graduates who have degrees, who are working in professions that have very little to do with the career that they've chosen. Increasingly, employers are looking for strong employability skills. So what I'm talking about here is the ability to be innovative, to problem solve, the ability to work in teams, for example. And they're looking for commercial awareness. How aware are students of the business world and how it works? A lot of this will be gained through part-time employment, although we do focus on employability skills at school and we do highlight these in our careers week every year that the students are with us at KGGS. So our students should have an awareness of those things. But it is well known that contact with employers is really helpful in terms of securing employment when you graduate. Many courses have a year in industry, so it's worth our students considering those courses because they create those vital links that might lead to a job after university. Universities like Aston, for example, have the majority of their courses, um, including some time in industry. So what are the hardest to get onto courses? Well, these do change every year, and it's simply a picture of demand and supply. The top courses there, things like medicine, dentistry, vet science, they are all going to, always going to be um, difficult to get onto, and that is because um, the university is going, going to be very wary about taking people onto a five-year expensive course when they're not fully committed. So there is going to be this rigorous selection process. But also, they are limited to how many of those courses that they can offer because of their funding. And there's a large number of students wishing to take those courses. The other courses are all to do with popularity. Um, you know, what's been going on on the international stage um, and in terms of politics, politics has become interesting in the last couple of years. That has meant that international relations and politics, a previously not particularly popular subject, has really climbed the rankings. And with all the issues um, to do with mental health, psychology has also climbed the rankings recently. So it, meant that it has meant that those courses have been harder to get on. 
But the, the, the bottom three on that list, it's all to do with um, how many of them are available at university. And because they've become much more popular courses, many more universities are offering those courses. So you will find that there is a large range of universities and entry criteria available to our students. So although they might have a slightly higher entry requirement than they have in the past, as I say, there, there are lots of universities that have just started offering those courses. Hardest to get into universities? Well, I've listed um, the ones that are um, perhaps the lowest in the percentages of applicants receiving an offer. Now, again, some of these universities, it's simply because they are quite small. And some you would just expect to be on the list, things like Oxford and Cambridge, uh, LSE and uh, Imperial. It is worth just having a look through those, though, to think about the combination of courses that a student puts onto their application. If we look at hardest to get into by the entry criteria, um, it, it, it is quite reflective of the previous slide. And it's probably the universities that you would expect. All I would do is encourage our students not to perhaps make five choices from that list, to make sure that they've got at least one or two other universities in there. How long will it take? Or for parents, really, the question should be, how long am I going to be paying for this? Um, most honours courses last three years. Um, some courses have a foundation year on offer. Now, these are courses that extend the, the period of study by one year, and they are um, aimed at preparing students for their degree course. So they're sometimes offered when students don't e meet the entry criteria on results day, they might offer a foundation year um, as a substitute, or if students haven't taken quite the right A-levels for the course that they wish to study. Foundation degrees unfortunately have a very similar name, but they are different. They are the old HNDs. They are two years work-related courses, often offered by colleges, so uh, institutes of further education rather than higher education. And these sometimes have a top-up year to convert to an honours degree. They tend to be more practically based. And then we've got sandwich degrees, or sometimes known as higher apprenticeships, which these um, include work place, paid placements, and they often are sponsored by um, employers. Sometimes you would apply direct to the employers for these courses, and these are sometimes three, sometimes four years. They are um, hard to come by. They are brilliant courses, but they do attract a large number of applications. And medicine, vet science, dentistry, they all take five years. Students often ask me which is the best university. And I think it's really important that they broaden their perspective once more and think about what is the best choice for them. More traditional universities, they will um, perhaps spend less time teaching. They will... Um, set examinations every year and expect the students to be perhaps much more um, self-driven, whereas universities that are newer tend to have much more contact time and much, much stronger one-to-one -one, um, tuition. And then at the other end of the scale, you have Oxford and Cambridge who have their tutorials and seminars. So it's really important that with that wide range of experience available, the student thinks about what support, guidance, help and tuition they might benefit the best from and make their choice based on that. The only way to decide is through thorough research and it's harder, it's got much harder because of the pandemic there is a lot more information available online. There are virtual open days, taster courses and um, you know there's so much there. What we recommend to students that every time that they are on the internet, on any device, that they perhaps just spend an additional five or ten minutes trudging through some of the information to try to start to narrow down their choices. If this is one thing that we cannot do for our students, they need to, to do it themselves. And you as parents, again, you can't really do it for them. You could perhaps help them and encourage them. But this is going to be hugely time consuming. And the earlier they start, the better. Candidates who are considering Oxford and Cambridge, 
these tend to self-select. They t tend to be students who have really high grades at GCSE across the board. So I'm talking um, level seven or above in all of their GCSEs. But what's even more important than that is that they have a genuine enthusiasm and passion for the subject. They haven't gone out and done all those extracurricular and supercurricular things um, just to get a place at Oxford and Cambridge, that they actually are truly passionate about the subject. And not only are they passionate about the subject, but they enjoy researching it and they enjoy debating it with other people at a really um, deep level. Those students, you tend to be able to pick them out. You tend to know who they are, and they tend to know who they are too. So when investigating university courses, what are the things that students should be looking at? There's a good list here, and I, I, I leave you to peruse this at your leisure. But it is important to think about everything. It's not just about the course. It's not just about whether it's a city university and it's in Leeds or it's in Norwich on a campus. What they need to consider is everything. It is a whole experience. It is a life experience. So they need to look at everything. What do people get wrong? Well, these are the top three reasons, not for dropping out nationally, but, but why KGGS students tend to come back and wish to reapply. The top number one reason is that, the, that it's the course. They didn't research the course enough, and it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. The second point, feeling homesick. It's not like a week away with their friends in Ibiza. It's, it's more... 10 weeks, 12 weeks in a hall of residence with, with people who, who are like-minded in the same situation, but away from home. Here's where you know, the location of that university becomes important, how easy it is to access parental support. But they are going to be away for a, an extended period and they might feel homesick. They might just apply because everyone else did. It's much easier to fill in a UCAS application than to go through the rigorous selection procedure for apprenticeships or jobs with training. Lots of students, particularly with the pandemic and um, you know, feeling a little bit worried about going away from home, might consider going to university but living at home. I don't necessarily think this is a bad idea. And for some students, it's ideal. But I just can ask them to consider these questions before they go ahead with this. You know, really have a good think about it, whether it's the right thing for them. If there are any special reasons why a student might wish to stay at home or to be near home, then um, it's important that they let us know because we do have quite a few universities locally and they do offer schemes for students who particularly need to stay near home. It might affect the entry criteria, for example. And it's useful also for us to put this into the reference so that universities are aware of it and might make some special consideration due to that. So please make us aware if there's any reason for this. So graph here showing the population of 18-year-olds. You can see that in 2020, we've had a real drop in the number of 18 year olds and that the numbers have been falling for um, at least five years. This is on the increase again now, but we're still at quite a low level. So what should student strategy be? Well, with the awareness that there's still quite a low number of 18 year olds in the population, there is a lower number still of 18 year olds who have studied three A-level subjects and the more academic universities tend to favour students with three A-levels. There's a low number of 18 year olds offering three A-levels with grades A, B, B or above and given that we are a grammar school the majority of our students will achieve that level or above. So that means that those students are in short supply. Each student will have five choices or four if they're applying for medicine, dentistry or vet science. So what should they do? Well, they should look at two aspirational choices. So two universities who are looking for entry criteria that is slightly higher than that student is expected to achieve. Two realistic ones, 
and one looking for grades slightly lower than their predicted grades. Not a lot lower, but just slightly lower as a, a contingency. Students who are thinking of carrying on with art study, they will probably want to do a foundation course before taking a degree. Art foundation courses are mainly offered at higher education institutions. There are some offered at universities as well, but because they are self-funded, students tend to stay at home while they do those. Our art department are really um, good at offering advice um, and have a lot of contacts with ex-students who are studying art foundation or have studied art foundation um, courses locally and they can give a lot of advice and help. There's also advice on drama and music school applications from the relevant subject staff because these schools and conservatoires have different application systems. What about student finance? A lot of our students will be worried about that. We know that students are going to leave university with a form of debt. Lots of university websites have really good sections explaining how student finance works. Also, the Students Finance England website is really, really helpful and their advisors are really good at answering queries on the phone. It's nothing to worry about quite yet though because applications for this particular year group for student finance don't really start until April 2022. It is important to realise that students are very unlikely to pay back all of the loan or anything like the amount that they will borrow. So it really shouldn't be a deciding factor, but rather than me go into the detail of all that, I'd like to refer you to the Money Saving Expert website where Martin Lewis, in a short video, will really explain how student loans operate. Um, and it's so self-explanatory, it's about a 20 minute video. So that really concludes this presentation on what's going on in higher education at the moment and what kind of uh, research our students should be getting on with right now. If you have any further queries about any of the issues that I have um, gone over in this presentation, please feel free to contact the Sixth Form team. Just to remind you that there are two other presentations in this series, one which is on the setting and use of predicted grades and how they relate to progress grades, and the other one is on the actual application process that our students will go through. And I would encourage you to um, have a look at those two. Thank you very much. <laughs>